Ecclesiastes chapter 3, fuel series, a trip through the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to start in verse 16. Um, if you're visiting with us, I'm Gordon Dabbs. I'm one of the ministers. Um, you can get on version and kind of follow the sermon this morning, live events, version. Preston, type in Preston Crest there. You can get our app and listen to stuff on there. You can get on our website and get content as well. We're glad that you're here if you're visiting with us. Starting in verse 16 of chapter 3. I also noticed that under the sun there is evil in the courtroom. Yes, even the courts of law are corrupt. This is the New Living Translation. I said to myself, in due season, God will judge everyone, both good and bad, for all their deeds. I also thought about the human condition, how God proves to people that they are like the animals. For people and animals share the same fate. They, they both breathe and both must die. So people have no real advantage over the animals. How meaningless both go to the same place. They both came from dust. They both returned to dust. Who can prove that the human spirit goes up and the spirit of animals goes down into the earth? So I saw that there is nothing better for people than to be happy in their work. That is why we are here. No one will bring us back from death to enjoy life after we die. Again, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. The oppressors have great power and their victims are helpless. So I concluded that the dead are better off than the living, but most fortunate are those who are not yet born, for they have not seen all the evil that is done under the sun." So where do we find meaning? Where do we find freedom? Where do we go to find hope? The book of Ecclesiastes re relentlessly asks questions. And Solomon is unwilling. These are tough questions, as you saw this morning. And Solomon is unwilling to let us get away with easy answers. He demands honest answers to those questions. And that is the journey we're on in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's going to ask these questions. It's going to demand honest answers. Now, un underlying all of these questions is the ground rule that he set up in the beginning using this phrase, under the sun. And he's going to use this phrase over and over again in the book of Ecclesiastes, which basically means he is going to, from the beginning, set this ground rule that we cannot appeal to faith for our answers in his book, right? He is going to almost exclusively look only at life under the sun, only look at the physical universe that we have access to through our five senses. So faith is not an option uh, in looking to, for answers in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a very different Bible book. And if faith isn't a place we can go to for our answers as he asks these questions, then what is? Where is it that people look apart from faith for their answers? And so he's going to talk about material success, financial success. Perhaps that is a place where you can find hope, freedom, meaning. He's going to talk about talent, about physical beauty. He's going to talk about work. Maybe those are places that we can go to for pleasure. He's going to talk about pleasure, all right? And each one of these places that we look to, apart from faith for meaning, he is going to test, and he is going to find that while some are better than others, while some are more potent than others, while some are more lasting than others, he is going to conclude that in the end they are all fatally flawed. So in the passage we read this morning, Solomon takes on justice, right? It would seem that pretty much everyone has a notion of what's right and what's wrong. Furthermore, it would seem that pretty much everyone agrees that justice is a good thing. I mean, you can debate the merits of money. You can debate the merits of pleasure. You can debate the merits of work. But this one seems to be different, doesn't it? 
I mean, justice, you're going to have a really hard time finding someone who's going to be the devil's advocate and say justice is a bad thing. I mean, this seems to be different. This seems, Solomon seems to have finally found one that everyone can pretty much agree on. It's a good thing. Maybe justice really is different from the others. Then again, maybe, maybe it's not something we can hang our hats on. And if you've been with us up to this point in the book of Ecclesiastes, you pretty much know where Solomon is going to go. Now remember, this book is written well over 2,000 years ago. So um, if, you're not, if you don't believe in the inspiration of Scripture, you're probably going to say, well, this has got to be outdated. This has got to be antiquated. Um, when it comes to a topic like justice or the justice system, I mean, these ancient words surely are irrelevant today. Verse 16 Verse 16, he says, I noticed, so this is what I kind of observed, Solomon says, that under the sun there is evil, where? Evil in the courtroom. Yes, even the courts of law are corrupt. So let's, let's get clear on something. The courts of law are the one place more than any other where we really, really try to get it right right? I mean, it is, if there is any place we try to get it right, where we try to find justice, where we try to find fairness, where we, where we try to prosecute the guilty and, and, and acquit the innocent, it is in our courtrooms. And here Solomon is going to this place where we really, really try, and he says, they're evil. I find evil in the courtroom. So that is Solomon. Um, now, to, you know, oh, he, he reigned probably 3,000 years. I mean, he reigned around 3,000 years ago. So certainly more barbaric times those. But look at us. I mean, we live in the United States of America. We just celebrated Independence Day. We have a constitution which protects our rights. We have a bill of rights. And we have a, a justice system which has evolved many centuries since Solomon's day. Um, and and certainly has gotten better to, in many extents at, at, at jurisprudence and at, 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 at doing justice. And look at all of the, today, look at all of the legal experts that we have today. I mean, men and women who have uh, essentially dedicated their lives to the study of law, to the practice of jurisprudence. I mean, we have so many more than Solomon would have had in his day. Um, I read an article from the New York Times talking about the year 2011, and the article was talking about the huge number of graduates from law schools in the United States. And in fact, the article kind of went state by state, and it was talking about the surplus of lawyers. Now, you've probably heard about this before, but this was just looking at 2011. And the surplus, how they get this, is you take the number of people, not just who've graduated from law school, you take actually the number who have actually passed the bar exam in one of our 50 states. They have passed the bar and there is not a job. So you compare the number of job openings in legal related fields to the number of people passing the bar exam. And in 2011, there were over 27,000 more who passed the bar than there were actual jobs. So there is this surplus of 27 lawyers coming out of, uh, through the bar exam last year. So, when it, so surely we've got justice covered with, with this surplus of, of legal experts roaming around our country. Now, I'm sure you haven't noticed any hint of sarcasm in what I've been saying up to this point, but have you? I mean, we, we, really, we really don't have this one covered. Um, in our country, which, which does fairly well compared to other countries, I would imagine, um, on justice, in our country, justice happens on some occasions, uh, just sometimes justice happens. Um, for some people, it happens. But factors like how well you are educated or how much money you have to hire the very best legal team possible, those factors play a, a factor, if, if not a huge factor, in determining how you will do in your day in court. Truth is... And I think we would all agree, truth is, the better off you are financially, the better chance you have of getting justice for yourself in a court of law. In other words, the better, ch the better chance you have of getting the verdict that you are after. Um, 
I don't know how many of you guys, probably a lot of you are, most everyone's aware of the Jerry Sandusky trial, and some of you probably followed it pretty actively because it was, it was very interesting and very disturbing and, and was a mixture of, of college football and child abuse and all this. So, so this guy who was a coach for forever, a respected coach at Penn State, he apparently was, was systematically abusing children, in fact, using this nonprofit foundation he established to, to, to abuse boys, all right? So you have this trial that comes out, and apparently evidence was ignored by some very important people over a couple of decades. Finally, he has his day in court, and you have this series of, of they're not young anymore, these seri- this series of men who come forward and say, yes, he abused me. You have one of his, his fellow coaches there at Penn State who actually was an eyewitness. I mean, you, you have his own son coming out. Now, if you're like me, As the jury goes back to make their decision, if you're like me, you're kind of nervous. Okay, he was found guilty, all right? But you're kind of nervous when the jury goes back because sometimes the jury brings back the right verdict and sometimes they don't. I mean, we had Casey Anthony just a little while ago in another big case. Sometimes you can pile up all of the evidence you want, But you get these 12 people gathered in a room and they don't necessarily come back with the right verdict, even in these high-profile cases. So so I got a little bit nervous. Um, I get nervous because you just don't always know how things are going to work out. I mean, what about Carl Truman, 19 years old, Los Angeles, California? Um, He sued his neighbor because his neighbor ran over his hand with a Honda Accord. Carl Truman won $74,000 plus medical expenses. But here's the thing. Um, his, His neighbor didn't see Carl. But what Carl was doing when his hand got run over, Carl was stealing the hubcaps off of his neighbor's car. Neighbor runs over his hand, he sues his neighbor, wins a whole bunch of money from his neighbor. That is one of many stories that you can find on how our justice system works or doesn't work. Then, as it come out in recent years, there are all of the stories about the DNA exoneration. So many people, in fact, around 300 that we know of so far, were, 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 were convicted, sent off, to do time, and now DNA evidence has proved they actually did not do the crimes they were convicted of. Now, on one side, you're like, that's terrific. I'm so glad that we've made this progress, and now we're exonerating these people. But what about the combined 3,000 years of prison time these innocent people did? I mean, where's the justice for them? Really great. They're, they're free now, but, but they went into prison on average when they were 27, on average, these 300 exonerees, and on average, they got out of prison when they were 40. Where's the justice in that? So Solomon says, looking at his world 3,000 years ago, Solomon says, you know, justice comes out just as flawed as all of the other candidates for meaning do. The idea of justice, amen, yes, love it, great. The reality of justice in this world under the sun, not, not, not so great. Even in a great country like ours with a great constitution, our track record is, is far from perfect. So, remember here, Solomon is testing justice to see if it is 100% dependable, 100% reliable. The idea is, the practice is not. He is not saying we shouldn't care about justice. He is not saying we shouldn't care about who our judges are. We shouldn't care about how well we train our lawyers in this country. What he is saying is, we live in a world under the sun where justice simply will not always be done. Uh, We live in a world where it does matter how much money you have, the connections you have politically or socially. Those things will affect the decisions that are reached by our courts. What about this? Because up to this point, we've been talking about the justice system. We've been talking about the place where we try with all of our might to get the right decisions. 
But what about the rest of the world? What about the other 99.9% of our lives lived outside of the justice system? How well do we do there? Well, you can imagine if we don't do so well in the justice system, we probably don't do better. In fact, we probably do a lot worse out of the justice system. Um, This week I was looking at a study, New York Academy of Sciences, that found that attractive people tend to do a better job getting jobs and tend to get paid better than less attractive people. So whether or not they're able to do their job well, whether or not they are the smartest, the most competent, the most experienced, often it gets trumped by who is better looking. (laughs) Where's the justice in that? I mean, fairness, merit, justice, they don't always play a factor in the way things work out there, do they? I mean, if you happen to be gifted so that you can throw a baseball... 95 miles an hour, you're going to make like $12 million a year, all right? If you happen to be gifted at teaching children mathematics, you're going to make like $40,000 a year, right? So which of the two has the harder job, the guy who throws the 95-mile-an-hour ball or the person that spends all day teaching Second graders, mathematics, who has the harder job. Um, Now, this is the funny thing. We live in a world, to make the point even clearer, we live in a world where people will actually debate this. That's what's so crazy. People will actually debate this. Solomon's world of around 1000 BC was a world in which the king saw, he observed a lot of things that just weren't right, weren't fair. Um, a lot of things that didn't seem to work out the way they should have. And in 2012, have things really changed all that much? Liberty and justice for all. Really? Based on Solomon's under-the-sun view, under-the-sun observations, the optimistic view is that justice will happen. The best view you can take is that justice will happen sometimes. But under the sun, the most optimistic view is it's pretty patchy. Justice is pretty much a hit and miss sort of thing. So in the end, Solomon says, the under the sun perspective is not the only Perspective. He pulls back the curtain a little bit, breaks out of his song and dance of under the sun life, and he says, there is something else going on. Verse 17 of chapter 3, I said to myself, in due season, God will judge everyone, both good and bad, for all their deeds. Now the, the philosopher turns his question to animals and people. He says, are we really all that different? Verse 18, I thought about the human condition, how God proves to people that they are like the animals, for people and animals share the same fate. Both breathe, both die, so people really have no advantage over the animals. How meaningless. He concludes that people and animals are pretty much alike. I mean, even now with our DNA, um, with the Genome Project and everything, we found that human beings have about a 2.5% difference between human beings and mice. So really, even science is proving we're not all that different. I mean, he says, I mean, you can think of it like this. When your dog Patches gets hungry, your dog eats, just like you do. When Patches gets tired, Patches sleeps. When Patches has an itch, Patches scratches himself, just like you do. When Patches is attacked, Patches defends himself, just like you do. Now, you do some other things that are certainly things that he can't do, but there are a lot of similarities. And the ultimate similarity Solomon points to is no matter what you do, no matter how well you do it, exercising, controlling your diet, all of this stuff, you and Patches will both die. So what, he says? Death equalizes. What about heaven? What about the afterlife? Verse 20, he says they both go to the same place. 
They came from dust. They returned to dust. Who can prove that the human spirit goes up and the spirit of animals goes down into the earth? So I saw that there is nothing better for people than to be happy in their work. That's why we're here. No one will bring us back from death to enjoy life after we die. Keep in mind, Solomon is focusing on life under the sun. He's focusing on a world where faith is not a factor. And he says, in that world, people and animals pretty much have the same lot. It's also good to keep in mind, the Old Testament does not have a lot to say about the afterlife. I mean, there are hints in some of the Old Testament books about life after death, but they are few and far between. So in a way, Ecclesiastes is pretty much in line with that. Now, let's talk about, I think this raises the question, how do people tend to think about life after death? Well, some folks agree completely with this under the sun perspective. I mean, I guess you could call this view number one. Some people believe life after death, no. When you die, what happens? Nothing. Zero. You cease to exist. That's all there is. Now, this is the least popular view. If you were to poll people around the world, it's not the most common view, but it, but it is out there. The second view goes like this. When you die, what happens? Well, when you die, you get another chance. You come back again. You may come back in another part of the world. You may come back in a different socioeconomic class, but when you die, you come back. This is called reincarnation. Um, in Brazil, we ran into a lot of people, spiritists, who believe in reincarnation. It's an important part of their, of their belief system. They would even put bumper stickers on their cars that said, reencarnação, uma questão de justiça. Reincarnation, a question of justice. You see, they believe reincarnation was the way you solved these two questions that Solomon raises about life after death and about justice. Why? How? Well, they believe that if you mess up in this life, you get to come back again and, and fix those errors. And, and there's kind of this ethical evolution that goes on. And maybe after 100 or 200 lives, at some point, you're going to get it right. You're going to fix your mistakes. Um, so, that, so they think it kind of addresses that question of life after death, and it also has this benefit of, of addressing this question of justice, which we were talking about, that you kind of keep getting do-overs until you get it all right. The problem with that is you and I pretty much know that's wrong, and you don't have to be a believer to know that's wrong. I mean, if you're anything like me, you could give me one life, you could give me a million lives. Well, I'm not ever going to get it all right. I'm always going to make mistakes. I'm never going to be just. I'm never going to be righteous on my own. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3 basically says if you believe in reincarnation, if you believe that at some point you're going to get it all right, you, you've got to be kidding, right? I mean, come on. Have you looked at the world around us? And here we are in the 21st century. So we've evolved so far now ethically morally, philosophically, who do you know personally who gets it all right? Who do you know personally that is absolutely fair 100% of the time? If they're not, if you don't know that person, it means they're all unjust to some extent, all right? But then you have the witness of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says this, important verse to weigh in on this topic. It says this, just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. So scripture teaches, the biblical view teaches you get one life, you will have one physical death, and you will face judgment before God one time. In other words, justice ultimately gets done. Not by you, not by you fixing all of your imperfections, but justice gets done by God. This is the biblical view. You're not really going to find this view popping up a lot in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, you're going to have to go to other places in Scripture. Ecclesiastes does a really good job of asking questions. The rest of the Bible does a good job of answering the questions that the book of Ecclesiastes asks. Check out Paul, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says this, starting in verse 20. In fact, 
So this is a matter to Paul of historical fact. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first. In other words, this isn't a unique one-time event. This is going to happen to all of us. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ is raised as the first of the harvest. Then all those who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Here's my question for you. There is a huge gulf between Ecclesiastes and the Apostle Paul. A huge gulf, a huge distance. Solomon says, there's no proof. Where's the proof that anything different happens to people as opposed to animals? So what happened in between Solomon and the Apostle Paul? What happened was this guy named Jesus. That's what happened. I mean, here's a guy who lives as this itinerant rabbi, for dies a premature death, and is resurrected. And by the way, he predicted all of this would happen. That's what happened between Solomon and Paul. That's why Paul can be so absolutely confident in 1 Corinthians. But Jesus predicts he will die and he will be raised on the third day, and that is exactly what he does, and it's viewed by over 500 witnesses. That, by the way, is how a young carpenter rabbi from a backwater village of the Roman Empire comes to be the acknowledged Christ of even the Roman government. I mean, the very people that put him to death end up making him God and worshiping him because of the historical fact of his resurrection. If you want a nutshell version of how that happened, that's how that happens. Um, I mean, that's a pretty good, pretty good way to lock that up for yourself. If you die and are resurrected, um, to, to, to end up being worshipped, that's a pretty good way for that to happen. Now, there's something even more amazing. And that is, Paul hints at this, or Paul doesn't hint it, he says it, that is that you and I will be resurrected from the dead as well. Um, Jesus is having a conversation at one point during his ministry with one of his very good friends, a woman named Martha, and Jesus shares these words. He says in John chapter 11, in verse 25, he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. He says, I am the key to life after death. So, one day, the Bible tells us, justice will be done perfectly and completely. As Solomon notes in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 17, it won't be done because our justice system evolves to a point where it gets everything right, or you and I evolve to a point where we become perfectly just people. It will be done by God himself. Now, if you're tracking with me on this up to this point, you're beginning to see a bit of a problem for us. The problem is, if justice is going to be done, if a perfect judgment is going to occur, you and I are in big trouble because we are not innocent. We have sinned. We have made crucial errors. We have violated God's will. All of us have. The problem is there's going to be a judgment and I'm not just. The problem is there's going to be a judgment and if God is a perfect judge, he cannot declare me innocent. He cannot declare you innocent and be just. That's why, and this is the cool thing, as you put the New Testament together with the book of Ecclesiastes. That's why Jesus becomes the definitive answer to both of the questions that Solomon has raised today. First of all, Solomon says, what about life after death? There's no proof that that exists. Jesus becomes the answer. Yes, there is. And on this question of, of justice, Jesus becomes the answer as well. How can anyone escape the perfect judgment of God? Well, it's through Jesus. 
The only way to be made right, the only way to become just, to be justified, is through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. He gave up his life for you. His justice, his righteousness, his perfect life becomes yours. He gives that to you. He imparts that to you as he takes away your sins. The cross is our only hope. Even the Old Testament teaches that. Isaiah 53, the prophet receives this word from the Lord. In verse 5, the prophet says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was cursed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. So he did the time. He did the time for you. And then verse 11, the prophet receives this word from the Lord. My righteous servant will what? Justify. He says, my righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. In other words, you and I will be declared just through Jesus. And so he becomes this historical person, Jesus Christ, becomes the answer to both of the questions that Solomon is asking this morning about resurrection from the dead and about finding justice one day. Now, having faith... Believing that faith is a factor. Believing that God is at work in our world. It doesn't deny, it doesn't ignore physical, philosophical truths of the world. But it does mean we recognize that this world is not all there is. Under the sun is not the only place from which truth is. Comes. Living by faith means that we are powered by someone above the sun. Living by faith means that we know there is an important reality, in fact, something far more permanent and eternal than what we see under the sun. So the question this morning is this Have you put your faith in Jesus? If you're looking for justice, Put your faith in Jesus. If you're looking for a life after this one, put your faith in Jesus. Have you done that? Have you accepted his sacrifice on your behalf? Has he taken your iniquities away, your injustices away through his sacrifice? Have you been made right with God through Jesus? Do you have hope that the grave will not have the last word? The only place you'll find that is through Jesus. Have you find, found a life that is lived for his eternal glory, not for your temporary self-interest? You'll find that in Jesus.